All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome back. We're so glad to have you. Hello. We're so glad to have you. And if for just a couple little housekeeping things, if we can make sure that everybody has their um, microphones muted until we are in our chat rooms, which we're going to be there very shortly. That way we don't have any feedback. Um, you're more than welcome to leave your cameras on um, if your computer bandwidth can support it, but if it is challenging, turning your cameras off does make the um, speed go a little bit faster for you. Um, yesterday we had an outstanding day. I know um, I was really excited to work with all of you as a facilitator, but also incredibly excited to also be participating on the side as a full-time educator and mm -hmm. Um, getting the opportunity to hear from Rebecca about the museum and the, the wonderful opportunities that exist there um, make me even more excited to be there in person for a program in the future. Uh, and then getting the opportunity to see the amazing resources that Arts and Remembrance has. Uh, yesterday, we were able to combine our approaches, taking a look at pre-war Jewish life and shadows of hate examining not only the experiences of a German Jew during the 1930s, but then also <clears throat> beginning to learn about the experience of Esther, both through her art and through her voice. And so that was a really special treat to hear her voice through eyewitness and then see her art and then hear her daughter, Bernice Steinhardt, who truly brings her mother's stories to life in the present day. We then looked at themes that each of you saw in Esther's work through the exercise with the jam board. And I know some of the themes that really stood out to us were resilience and family and overcoming challenges and survival and community and kindness. And I was really inspired by um, one of our participants yesterday in the chat box suggesting that we all make a point uh, to perform an act of kindness in Esther's memory over the course of our days. And so that was something that really stood out to me. Um, so excited to see all of the ideas in the Jamboard and the link for the Jamboard as well as all of the other resources from yesterday are available in the working document. Um, and I'm actually going to take a moment now and display that working document on my screen just to, again, kind of reiterate what, um, what we have going on with it. So this is a document that we created for you to be able to return to at any point in time. Um, it will be live long after this program has concluded. Um, and so I'm just scrolling up to um, a few things that we want to make sure to point out to you. Um, first of all, I know not everybody is Zoom savvy, but some of you are. Um, if you're joining us for the first time today, there's some great tips here on Zoom. One of the other things that we suggest is that you um, consider what we call splitting your screen uh, and what that would involve. And I'm going to actually show you, um, oh, I don't have the ability to share my whole screen apparently. Um, but what you would do is you would click on this um, in the upper right hand corner of your browser, um, your, your internet browser, and there's a box, or you may even see two boxes. If you click on that, it minimizes your screen, so it's still displayed, but it's not full screen. And you can drag it to be half of your screen, and then you can take your Zoom and also resize it to be the other half of your screen. Um, if you are currently only seeing Zoom, if you hover near the top of your Zoom um, toolbar, you might see the option to exit full screen, which allows you to keep Zoom running um, and then get things resized. So uh, if you have questions on that, feel free to ask us in the chat box, but that might help some of you uh, to go back and forth and experience the um, different things that we're going to be sharing with you. Um, as you go through, you'll see links to all of the content that we shared yesterday. Um, you'll see the ability to re-access the Jamboard if you want to review those screens. And then you'll also see, again, directions for last night's Padlet assignment. If you scroll down to page seven, you'll see our agenda for today begins. We've moved the sign-in um, to this page be a fourth column. You can just type your initials into that column and that will count as your sign-in for today. 
Um, and as you go down through, if you're having trouble finding your name, if you hit control F and then type in your name, that should help you locate it. Um, and so you'll have the ability then to just add your initials um, to this and we'll reorganize and resize it so it looks a little bit neater as the day is going on. Um, but you can see we've got a really wonderful amount of participants from all over the United States and the world. And so we'll get you on there. Um, so we're gonna start today. Um, I've actually pulled the Mentimeter, so we're not gonna use that to check in this morning. Um, but we're gonna begin with a review of the pieces of home that you shared. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Claire, who's gonna talk to us more about this exercise. Yeah, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed um, yesterday and looking at the comments. Um, again, those themes of home and um, you know friends and and kindness um, they really resonated. And as I looked at the Padlet um, both last night and this morning, um, I saw that many of you were inspired and. Um, put images and drawings and even some um, modern art. Um, we'll get to those. Um, what we were looking at was really to um, take a theme, um, make it relevant to um, share your emotions through um, visual art or through um, your own words to describe it just as um, Esther did. And so um, what we're gonna do next is go into uh, breakout rooms and share our pieces, have some time to talk about it. And then um, when we come out, we can you know, quickly address maybe some of the comments that um, we hear as facilitators. And um, then the rest of the day is going to be a lot of sharing and learning and I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. So I think now we are going to split into our groups. Um, again, I'm going to hang back real quick just to make sure everyone goes where they need to. And then this will be about a 20 minute session. Um, so kind of plan for that. And then we will recall everybody back. All right, here we go. We touched on some of the themes. Um, um, you know, I think the bottom line is that home isn't physical. You know, home can be a feeling or um, something else. I know we even got to the point where um, we realized that school is home for a lot of us. Um, and we're missing that a lot right now. So it came out in, um, in the stories that you told both, um, you know, through words and visually. Um, so I was truly inspired and I keep going onto that Padlet and I'm seeing things that I didn't see before. So we do invite you to continue to go onto that Padlet and, um, you know, add or continue to comment or like. I, um, you can put little hearts there if you really love something. And as you see, this was a great way um, for us to build a community. Um, when Bernice um, shared yesterday about uh, stitching our stories and you saw the groups within, you know, the gallery talking, unfortunately, we don't have that option right now. I mean, one day we will. But in the meantime, these Padlets are a really nice way to build a, a community, to have a space where, um, you know, either your students or your colleagues, you can post um, reflections or as you saw now, we um, posted images and, and, you know, we could call them even works in progress. Um, maybe this was just the idea you had yesterday and maybe you want to build that out with um, items that you have at home or if you are a fiber artist, you know, maybe this is an idea that one day you'll stitch or paint or um, those of you who started with poetry, um, I also write poetry and a lot of times um, that will bring out the visual to me. So I think this is a really wonderful exercise. I think it brings um, relevancy to a lot of issues um, and also makes those connections once you introduce your students to um, you know, the, the 
watershed moments of World War II. It's a lot to take in. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, things that maybe your students won't understand, but this is a really great exercise afterward for students to reflect and to, um, as someone um, in our group is going through, um, you know, some very hard times with um, the loss of a family member and this exercise was cathartic. It helped to kind of, you know, take away that, that pain in that moment. You And I wish that I could have, you know, heard from all of you, but um, as I said before, this is a great way to, um, you know, build community and share ideas and to, um, you know, work through a, progress, a process. So if you are, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, um, interested in project-based learning um, and doing these types of projects, Padlet is a nice place as a, a sounding board. Um, okay, and so I would love to introduce to you uh, our grant winner. Um, Art in Remembrance has uh, many grants for educators. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the grant process later, but I want to introduce Julie um, Dietrich Eisler. She is a elementary teacher at in Baltimore County at um, Lutherville Laboratory, and she's going to share with you um, a lesson plan and some of the um, creations of her students, as well as ways to kind of create a community um, outside of the classroom. Take it away, Julie. Oh, thank you so much. Can everybody hear me? Okay. I just wanted to first say um, thank you to every, everyone at AVAM and Art and Remembrance for allowing me to speak and, and giving me the opportunity with the grant and everything to work with my students. And um, so are, um, are you going to, um, okay, so um, I was going to show the, um, the uh, the first slide of um, that I wanted to show you about how I um, started talking to the students about the artwork. So the work on the left, which is called my my childhood home, I think is um, the work that I sh uh, introduced this unit to my fourth grade class that I wanted to. Um, I'm sorry. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> um, I want to go back because I wanted to tell you that I learned about this grant um, through um, through an educators night that I went to at the AVAM and that's how I found out about it and I applied for it and I wanted to do it with my fourth grade class. So, um, so then we, um, the way I introduced it, it was I was I was um, showing the students Esther's um, work of art, and I didn't really explain anything about her at first. I just wanted them to look at this first work of art and, and tell me what they saw. So they could look at visual cues, and they could see the uh, rows of veg vegetables, and they saw the farm animals. So they could tell me through that, they could see that it was a farm, and they could tell me that the artist was showing something about maybe her childhood. And um, so then we talk about, um, so then um, when I tell her, then I start to tell them about Esther Krenitz and her life. And I'm, I'm telling her that this was her childhood home in Poland um, before the Holocaust and that she was a Holocaust survivor. And I had, a my students were familiar with the Holocaust, so they had a lot to say about it. And, and there were a couple of students in particular that gave a lot of details about the Holocaust. Um, and I also explained that this is an example of narrative art and storytelling. And the way that this artist, I, I also asked them, how do you think the artist made this work of art? Because this artist wasn't a painter, she didn't draw, she had a very special way of telling her story. And 
we talk about, they can tell that it is somehow stitched or it's made with fabric. And then um, I, I talk about how Esther was a dressmaker. So that's how she, she wasn't an artist originally. She just wanted to tell her story. So she was a dressmaker. So she knew how to sew really well. She was an expert at that. So that's how she was able to tell her story. And then we look at the, slot, the um, work of art on the right hand side. And that is, um, I have the kids look at this and it's called We Fled Across the Field. And this is, I feel like this is a really profound work of art and it's really amazing. There's so much to it. I mean, Esther is able to express this moment in time when she's separating from her mother and she's taking her, her sister away with her and they're fleeing from the Nazis. And, you know, from the perspective you see that they're leaving from the point of view, because you're, you're looking at, you know, the back of the children and the mom and um, they're, they're not looking at you. They're looking away from you. And then the fact that the fields are two different colors just really shows that separation in a really profound way. And I think it's really powerful. So the kids, uh, we talk about, you know, metaphor and symbolism in this work of art and, and just how gifted um, Esther was in conveying feelings and being able to, to, to show what was going on, not just realistically, and I think the kids really uh, engage with this because with the stock with her style of work because um, it is very emotional and it isn't like a photorealistic. It's very it's on their level, and uh, so I think that's that's something that's really important. So. Um, So this is just, I also explained that this is just the beginning of Esther's um, journey and um, that there's, she does 36 panels and she goes through a lot of different trials and she's very resilient. She goes through all these trials before she's able to reach safety with her sister and she takes care of her sister. And um and I kind of focus on her resilience. And uh, students are really, they really relate to like superheroes. So I kind of try to um, liken her to a superhero because she goes through all these different trials and, and she, she succeeds because she can adapt so well. Um, So then in this class, this is the first class. So I'm explaining her work. We're looking at her work. We're analyzing it. Um, and students are then able to make their own sketch. And their sketch can be about something that's really important to them in their family. They're making a narrative storytelling sketch. And they do it on paper first. Um, and that's just the first day of this unit. Um, so after that, the next, the next lesson, we use the sketches. Now they have their plan for what they're going to make. So they use their sketches and then I get out the materials and we use um, felt as a background, like a nine by 12 inch um, felt rectangle and then um, scraps, scrap materials. And then, so the second day they use their sketch to do, to, you know, do the basic, um, the basic plan. And then on the third day, I get out the embellishments and I have all kinds of things that I've collected, but also um, through the grant, I was able to get like feathers and pom-poms and ribbons and buttons. And they use all those things to add and embellish and decorate their work of art. And then on the fourth day is a catch up day so that they can, um, you know, if there's any extra things that they need to add, they add 
then and also they write their artist statement. So they write about how they made their artwork and what their artwork is about. And this um, example is one student um, and he's writing about a dinner that he had with his family. So this is a memory of his dinner of the dinner. And I love the way that the food is sort of exploding out of the dish. And it's the, the dinners like uh, chicken and garlic with garlic sauce. But, you know, it, this is more of the emotions. He's showing the emotions of how exciting and um, how warm and fun it is to, to have this family dinner. And um, so he's just showing that with all these colorful embellishments. And I particularly like the way he used the, the edge of the pinking shears, you know, scissors um, to show the tines of the fork. I thought that was really a really nice touch. So this is his artist um, statement. He wrote down all the, his materials and he said, um, this is about a time where me, where my and my family gather around eat dinner and what we have is chicken with garlic sauce and rice. It's a food from my culture, El Salvador. Oh, that's the other thing I wanted to say is that I have students from all over the world in this one class and that was another way I think they're really engaged with Esther Krenitz because they had to leave their uh, home, their, their original home um, at an early age, just like Esther Krenitz. So I think they really relate to her. And I have students from, in this one class from El Salvador, Nigeria, Syria, and Russia. So, you know, they're, it's a real mix of kids from all over the world. So they all have that same feeling now. And this is on the left. This is a student um, who is made art about um, moving to Wisconsin. And on the left-hand side is a game that he likes to play. And uh, I'm not sure if it's a computer game or if it was like a ping pong. It kind of looks like ping pong. On the right is a student. She is. Uh, she made this about her cat. So there's like a little window at the top, and then there's the. You're looking down on the cat's dish, and at the bottom is the cat. And a lot of them uh, really connect to their pets. So there was a lot of a lot of uh, work about their pets. And this is a student who, um, he really just wants to be an inventor. And he um, wanted to, he wants to invent car, or designer, designer, inventor, engineer, and he wants to design cars. So this is a car of the future. And he, I like the way he added, like, I, I had this keyboard, I broke up um, an old keyboard and he had like, a pieces of the computer on, on it. And this is another student. Um, this was when he moved to this, his new home. So that's his house. Um, so I wanted to also talk about how this student, this student, how this lesson and this unit really allowed me to connect with my students. And um, I feel like they were really, you know, after talking about what Esther Krenitz went through, they were able to talk, they were able to communicate better with me. So that when we had, um, had to start when I had to start teaching online um, and uh, you know it was really difficult to, it's really difficult to teach art online first of all um, but there was one day in particular where the kids were super quiet and, and I knew something was wrong so I was asking them you know why are you so quiet 
And um, it was the shortly after um, George Floyd was killed. And so they were really upset and they wanted to talk about it. And I don't think that that would have happened if I had not taught this unit right before, um, before we went out on quarantine. And so they talked a little bit about it and, and we talked about how resilient they are and how these are really tough times right now and there's a lot going on, but um, how you guys are really tough and you're gonna, you're gonna be, you're gonna be okay. And it's a really good time to make art about how you're feeling. And one of the kids said to me, this is just like Esther Krenitz. So it, it really made me happy that they were able to make that connection. Um, and I know like a lot of educators right now are frustrated because it is very hard to teach online. And a lot of people are just worried that students are not getting um, the academic piece that they feel like students might be falling behind academically. But I feel like another important aspect of education is connecting with students, um, being able to communicate, showing empathy, and um, being able to express yourself and to process all these things that are going on. So I feel like art is the best vehicle for that. And this is a great unit to, um, to be able to do that with too. Oh, and before, um, my, my intention was to have a, I am connected with Make Studio in Baltimore and Hamden, and my intention was to have um, a gallery um, exhibition of the students' work, but that, that really wasn't, um, you know, obviously it can't happen now. But um, I just want to say that I'm still planning on in the future when I am able to do this lesson again, this unit again, to be able to do that. And there's so many pieces that, that you could have a, an exhibition, like just as an artist, I've shown in bakeries and I show, I was in a, you know, a health center I had artwork in. So there's a lot of different places that you can display the kids' work. And I think it really means a lot to them to see their artwork in a place other than the school and to also to be making that community connection. Thank you so much, Julie. And um, just to kind of wrap up the slide is um, even in this time of virtual learning, you know, um, link up with colleagues who may have similar interests, you know, talk about what you've learned over these two days and see if, you know, someone in your building, the lesson plans that both um, uh, echoes and reflections and art and remembrance have work across the curriculum. Um, so also, you know, even in this time of, of virtual connection, you know, there are clubs looking to, um, you know, engage the community or art centers, libraries and museums are still doing programming. And also, you know, maybe have families work together intergenerationally and just do something, give the family something to work on as a, you know, a, a project. Um, and then just a word or two about the grant. Um, in uh, the next week or so, we will be launching the 2021 mini grant. The mini grants are in the memory of a founding board member and progressive leader. Her name was Ronnie Dennis. And the um, grant goes to uh, educators who are working with um, the materials of art and story of Esther Nissenthal Krinitz. And that can be, you know, sharing the book, Sorry, I always get messes. The book, the film, um, the virtual gallery. We really encourage you to go into that virtual gallery um, to 
um, modify the lesson plans to engage your students um, using these exhibits as a springboard to teaching and learning in creative ways. Um, we want your students, young people in the community, to share their authentic stories in new ways that build confidence, agency, and capacity. And also, the, the grants can go towards sparking civic action among young people to address issues in community and community settings. And the reason that Ronnie really wanted this grant and the Board of Art and Remembrance was because it's a time of rising hate crimes, bullying and fear. fear. There's a lot of othering. And so we want to just be able to help teachers in a small way with these mini grants. And so everyone who's attended will receive information um, in the next coming weeks. And the best way to do that too is to follow us on social media or to um, sign up at artandremembrance.org for the teacher updates. And I think we're going into a short break. Um, Mave or Becca. Before we do, I just want to thank Julie for, uh, for her uh, description of her project. And in line with what, um, with what Claire was just saying about the social justice uh, dimensions of this, I was so impressed, Julie, that you were able to use this, uh, th that your lesson um, was so helpful to you in talking with your kids about George Floyd's death and about resilience and, um, and using art to make connections. I, I think that's just fantastic. So thank you for your work and thank you for your teaching. And, and, and thank you so much because I wouldn't have, um, I, I probably wouldn't have done this if I hadn't gone to the Art Educators Night and seen Esther's work and and got this opportunity. So thank you so much. And your students really. are really lucky to have you, Julie. And yeah. uh, we're lucky you, to Claire. know you have to. So we look forward to continuing the relationship. Um, and so Mabe, you want to take it away for break? <laughs> sure, sure thing. All righty. Um, actually, quick question though. Somebody did ask if the grant was open to people, to folks abroad. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, the, idea is, yes, okay. <laughs> the idea is to have, to use Esther's work in original ways and then to be able to share, to create a lesson plan from them and to be able to share um, the lesson plans globally. Right. And I think one thing that we're going to kind of tweak for the next round is that we're asking for ways to do this um, remote teaching and learning. And yeah. um, this will also help into making sure that people can um, replicate and adapt these lesson plans however they want. So um, be looking for that information real soon. Yep, and then before we go on a break too, um, just be sure Jennifer is has loaded a link a few times um, to preload the Echoes timeline. Um, so follow that link, preload that, so when we come back from our break, you're kind of set to follow along. And then I think Jen will take it from there. All right, folks, it is 10, 11, welcome back, I think. Just to keep things moving along. We're gonna get started. Hopefully you loaded your timeline. I just did mine, so it does take a little minute. So um, just give it some time to load. Um, let's see. Yep. So yes, and then we'll be doing the timeline and parallel stories activity now. I think this is where Jennifer and Claire kind of take off um, and we'll be going over those resources with you and what that timeline is. Where's Jen? <laughs> I had to un unmute and oh, there you go. <laughs> so I am here. <laughs> um, so um, Julie, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Um, it was really inspiring to hear not only about how you envisioned the project going initially and then the pivots that you made to make it work in a virtual setting. Um, I know so many of us just have that concern um, as head we're heading into the fall. And so that was really inspiring. Um, what we're going to do this morning is twofold. Um, we are going to talk a bit about some parallel experiences 
building on our theme yesterday of uh, the importance of broadening our students' understanding beyond a single story, uh, whether we're teaching with a piece of literature or focusing on a specific individual. Uh, those, foc those focal points are out absolutely outstanding and really help to foster empathy in our students and build their knowledge of a specific human story. But we also want to make them aware that there are other things happening. Uh, I think one of the most astounding realizations that my students have when I work with them, regardless of what the topic of history is, is that there are actually other things happening in the world that people care about when events that they're focusing on are also happening. And I think getting students um, to have that critical understanding of those events is incredibly important. And so it's going to be with that goal in mind that we are going to um, take a look at some specific resources this morning on the Echoes and Reflections website. Uh, and then we're going to also be combining some resources from Arts and Remembrance and Echoes and Reflections to talk about um, how you can apply some of these lessons with your students. So right now, I'm actually on the landing page of Echoes and Reflections. If you have already loaded the timeline and you want to open a new tab and follow along, please feel free. Um, if that's too much tech on your end, please do not feel obligated to do that. Um, but I just want to share with you where we're going to initially locate these resources, um, where we'll be talking about some other components of the story. So through watching the film and through Bernice's discussion yesterday, we learned about what was happening in Esther's life and what awareness Esther had of the events that were happening in the world around her. Uh, which of course was, was the world of Eastern Europe and that of Poland. Uh, one of the things that many students don't really understand um, is that when the Holocaust began in the 1930s, it was really only focused initially in Germany, then in annexed Austria, and then in the fall of 1938, the occupied Sudetenland. By the spring of 1939, it has stretched into the Bohemia and Moravia regions of Czechoslovakia. And then, of course, on September 1st, 1939, it begins to stretch into Poland and then from there, the rest of Eastern Europe. The Holocaust, as it began, many historians will tell you today, it did not begin with the, ex it, with the intention of actually exterminating all of the Jews of Europe. Uh, the initial belief that many what we call functionalist Holocaust historians uh, will tell you today is that initially the plan of the Nazis was to just push the Jews out of Germany, uh, whether that was through getting them to immigrate to the United States or what at that time was the mandate of Palestine. Um, there was even a plan at one point to send them all to Madagascar. Um, but the, the plan was to just get them out. Then in 1939, Thinking back to the map that we looked at yesterday, Nazi Germany invades Poland. They want more uh, space. They want space to grow the Aryan race. The, 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 the concept of, of you know, Lebensraum, we're going we're gonna to grow this race, uh, and, and we need the land on which to support these people. And when they invade Poland, of course, thinking back to that map, they inherit 3.5 million Jews. And so now the conversation begins to change. Obviously, we're not having success from a national perspective in getting the Jews to leave Nazi Germany. And our Unit 8, which focuses on perpetrators, collaborators, and bystanders, really looks at some of the problems of immigration. And I'm going to show you another resource this morning as well that really does a, a fine job with that. Um, they're not able to leave, and now we have 3.5 million more Jews. So, so the conversation begins to shift in the fall of 1939, and the decision is made to create ghettos. And so these ghettos, um, as you're going to see by scrolling down here in what we call Unit 4, these ghettos are located in what would be considered Eastern Europe today. Uh, and Eastern Europe back then. This particular map, I will confess, is my least favorite resource in Echoes and Reflections. I just don't like the, the clarity of it, and we are working to update it. 
Um, but this particular map shows us the location of the ghettos in what would eventually become known as Nazi-occupied Europe. Um, the pre-war boundaries, uh, pre-World War II boundaries are in gray. So what students don't initially realize because of how this map is laid out, but it's critical for their understanding, is that there are not any ghettos located in what we would consider to be Germany proper. The ghetto that is furthest to the west is in Central Europe. It's in Terezin or Theresienstadt, north of Prague. Um, this is a ghetto, by the way, if you are an art teacher, there is a wealth of information about art and performance art in the Terezin ghetto that is an absolutely incredible story in and of itself. Um, but all of the other ghettos are located in Eastern Europe. And the rationale behind this is twofold. One, it's where the bulk of the population is. So we're going to ghettoize them in places near their home. Esther spoke of Lublin. There is a fairly substantial ghetto established in Lublin pretty early on in the era of the Holocaust. Then we see ghettos that are going to eventually be established as the German army pushes further east. Um, the way that the map is coded is um, if you go up to the top, it tells you um, the year that the ghetto was created by the color. And then the larger the ghetto, the larger the dot. And so just sharing this map with students and showing them that the Germans intentionally created these ghettos in areas close to where the population was is an important geographical understanding. They would then ship Jews sometimes, not always, because every story in the Holocaust is unique, every experience is unique. Some Jews would be shipped from Germany to Terezin, particularly wealthy Jews, older Jews who were war veterans or who were in certain professions. Others would be shipped directly to camps, but some would be shipped to ghettos here in the East. And the reason why they also established the ghettos here and not in Germany was German documentation tells us that they did not want to expose their pure Aryan population to the disease and filth that inevitably followed by the very awful living conditions that were created with the existence of the ghettos. In unit four, Going back into the unit itself, um, there is a fantastic handout. Um, it is a secondary source piece um, on the ghettos itself. And I'm sorry, I gotta move my Zoom box up out of the way here from the right-hand side of the screen. I'm gonna drop this link in the chat box and also make sure that you have it available to you in the document itself, in our working document. Um, but it gives us an overview of the ghettos, of, of what the system of the ghettos was like, what so-called life in the ghettos was like. Uh, but for the purposes of our time this morning, um, I don't want to focus too much more on the nuts and bolts of the ghetto experience, but instead share with you the voices of individuals that experienced this life. And so the first individual whose voice I'm going to share with you is a gentleman by the name of Ellis Lewin. Ellis was born in Łódź, which is the uh, city in Poland where the second largest ghetto in Poland existed. Um, and Ellis was pretty young. He was born in 1932. And so when he comes into the Łódź ghetto, um, he is a 10 year old boy. And he is going to talk about his experience in the Łódź ghetto in this particular piece of testimony. Uh, and as you're listening to his testimony, I want you to think about words that stand out to you um, about his experience, not only uh, as an individual and a human being, but also in particular his experience as a child. And so here is Ellis. It was uh, the beginning of the end of survival of, of of becoming a different, uh, uh, a different existence, totally a different uh, human being, uh, another another world. That world was just fast and faster disappearing. I was constantly kept inside. I was was not to go out, so I was like inside forever, and we started living inside when any playing we did as children we did inside there was no no outside anymore 
And uh, the stories then were changing, you know, from Hitler invading to what we're going to do and how we should have done it. Now it's it's here, and uh, and uh, now how do now what do we do and what's going to happen tomorrow? It was no longer next week or uh, 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 what should we have done a year ago. Now we're confronted with a um, with the devil himself, and uh, and. Uh, no matter how I imagine how badly they, any, anyone perceived was going to happen, turned out infinitely greater so that uh, uh, we were instantly cut off from everything and uh, the, uh, the uh, instant uh, brutality, the instant uh, uh, orders, the instant uh, change uh, it was not a, a, a slower a way of, of introducing you into, into that kind of a existence. It was like the door shutting on you and that's it. Great. So what are some things that stand out to you from Ellis's testimony? Please feel free to share in the chat box. There's some things that stand out to you. Isolation. How fast everything changed. Yeah. And that's um, that's definitely something that connects back to Margaret's mention yesterday. Um, Mindy mentions the connection to today and being inside and making a life there, containment, the instantness of it. Eunice mentions things changing so rapidly, immediate, immediacy, like the door was shutting on you, the unknown, the unsure, from future thinking to survival, day-to-day -day thinking, his perception of time itself, there was no planning possible inside, outside, the devil himself had arrived, abrupt change, Joyce mentioning fear, motivating action, the beginning of the end. They knew this was the thing that they had been anticipating, the narrowing of the window of possibilities, the instantness of it, the all at once instantness of it, and becoming different. Um, and I think that one of the things that's really interesting is he's focusing on, you know, having to be stuck indoors and um, Working with this piece of testimony pre-March 13th versus now has definitely been, been a challenging experience because I've certainly approached it in a different fashion. Um, again, we're not saying that living in the ghetto is like living during the pandemic, but our students have a, a an association that they can make nowadays with this being stuck inside. Um, and for many of our students, the instantaneous nature of it which I think is also something that is an undercurrent of Ellis's testimony, because as a young child, his parents probably tried to shield him, much like my six-year-old daughter probably didn't hear the discussions leading up to um, the quarantine that my husband and I were having about what was happening in the world. For her, it was very sudden. Um, but I think Debbie men, you know, shares, it, it does give us perspective. I think that's one of the things about using testimony with students is that it can sometimes cause them to pause and step back outside of, you know, being so focused on what's happening to them and to themselves and recognizing, you know, that there have been other people who have faced worse challenges in history. Um, the association can then be pursued to the privilege we still have to stay at home, um, you know, orders now. Um, you know, in Ellis's case, he's not home with his, you know, smart TV and his tablet and things like that. He's in a very, very challenging situation. So if you want to delve more into the topic of the ghettos with your students, this lesson is really rich with resources on how to do that. Um, there are some beautiful pieces of poetry that are in this lesson. There are also additional testimonies and diary entries. For those of you teaching high school students, one of my most favorite resources in all of Echoes and Reflections is in this lesson, and it's right here on the bottom right. It's the diary of David Sarkoviak, um, who was a young boy who was in the Woods ghetto, um, and his, the, the arc of what happens in his experience in this curation of this piece of this diary is absolutely incredible. Um, to read. It's heartbreaking, but it's something that really resonates with my students. Um, diaries have a tendency to really reach young people, um, and if you're interested in even exploring them more deeply, uh, I can't also recommend um, Alexandra Zapruder's Salvage Pages collection um, strongly enough. So we just wanted to give you a brief glimpse um, at the experience in the ghettos. 
Um, this is a topic that I think can work really well with middle school students. I also think it's a topic that can be overlooked a lot of times when we're attempting to put a lot of um, complex material about the Holocaust into a short period of time. Um, many of us are, of course, much more familiar with the events of the final solution. Um, this is one of the lessons in Echoes and Reflections that we do caution educators to examine very closely before using it. Uh, it is a lot of very difficult material in this particular lesson. It's material that we really generally feel is pedagogically geared more appropriately to high school students and maybe eighth grade students as well. Um, there are various assets in this collection that could be used judiciously with middle school students. All of our assets are also listed in what we call our asset resource guide. This is like the testimony video guide that I shared with you yesterday, except instead of listing testimonies with each lesson, it lists, it lists actual content. Um, sorry, my chocolate lab is apparently alerting me. My husband has come home. Um, so um, you can see here the various pieces and components that are located within the lesson. So a review of that might be beneficial for you as well if you are planning on using um, some specific content from that unit with middle school students. And if you click on the piece, it then takes you to where that piece is located in the unit. Um, so in this particular unit, um, I wanted to, again, highlight two pieces of testimony to bring voice um, to an individual uh, that I think whose story will resonate with you. Um, I also want to to point out to you that we have some art available in Echoes and Reflections as well if you want to bring in some different forms of art to complement the art of Esther when you are working with the content from Art and Remembrance. We have additional poetry in this lesson um, and then we also have a secondary source handout that I'm going to be sharing with you on the final solution. This is great background information um, for you as an educator um, to learn more about the evolution of the final solution. Um, the evolution of the final solution will change once again from ghettos in 1939. They were first established in October of 1939 um, to, in June of 1941, a policy of mass extermination. That policy of mass extermination actually begins with the mobile killing squads known as the Einsatzgruppen. The Einsatzgruppen you can learn more about through an activity, a pre-build activity with our partners at Eyewitness. Um, but these were the mobile killing squads that spread throughout Eastern Europe and killed Jews um, in their towns and villages or right outside of them into mass graves. Bernice alluded to some events like that that had occurred in the vicinity of Esther's village yesterday. Um, but you can learn more about that specific piece in the section on the final solution. Um, and then if you want to, you can also navigate to the activity with eyewitness. Um, Eyewitness has hundreds of activities that are available to educators. Um, this is one that is known as a mini quest. Uh, it is done with a um, product outcome of students creating a journal. All of Eyewitness's activities are built on the four C's, consider, which gets students to learn a bit about a specific topic or person, because some of the activities are people focused. They then collect historical information and components of testimonies before constructing some type of product and then communicating that product with their peers. Um, this particular activity on the Einsatzgruppen because of its content is geared towards upper high school level students. But we have activities in Eyewitness that stretch down to um, elementary school age levels as well. Um, there are, as I mentioned, hundreds of activities. Um, I'm actually, um, I do consulting for them, so you're seeing 490 activities on mine, and there aren't quite that many accessible to you, but you can see the types of activities here on the left-hand side. We have video activities where students can build their own documentaries. Um, we also have, um, with, through the WeVideo platform, by the way, that is built into Eyewitness and is free. All of these resources are free. We have info quests where students create word clouds and retitle video segments to communicate with their peers. Mini quests like the one on the Einsatzgruppen have variable product outcomes like journals, collages, pieces of art. We have mini lessons, which are 15 to 45 minute lessons that can be based on specific topics or even skill building like building digital citizenship or listening skills. We have iWalks where you can take students on a virtual field trip. We have one of those so far. So you can take your students to the Horowitz Wasserman Holocaust Memorial in Philadelphia. 
We have GeoStory activities, which are fo focused on geography-based outcomes. And something that y'all can't see yet, but you will be able to soon, is we're currently testing our dimensions and testimony, which some of you may have seen on 60 Minutes, where you can actually have a conversation with a survivor's hologram. Um, and that's being transported into eyewitness so that your students can have an interactive conversation with a survivor. Um, so there's so much more to eyewitness and we shared the link with you yesterday when we viewed Esther's testimony. So I'd recommend if you have the opportunity to check it out, please do. Um, and you can then again also learn more uh, about the mobile killing squads in the Einsatz group and through that angle. Um, then the latter part of the um, secondary source piece on the final solution focuses then on the establishment of the six staff camps that were created throughout Poland. And a question came up yesterday regarding the handling of um, Poland and the history of their time under Nazi occupation. Um, it's been a very contentious topic and it's one that has been very challenging to Holocaust historians in recent years. Um, the Polish government firmly asserts that the actions that took place in Poland during the Nazi occupation um, should not be, you know, in any way, shape, or form um, associated with Polish government and or Polish memory. Um, there is a movement which has been largely supported by historians to not call camps in Poland, you know, Polish camps, because they were camps of the Nazi occupiers that were established in Poland. The line gets a little more blurred though in the fact that in Poland and many other countries that the Nazis occupied, citizens of those nations did in some cases um, support both with their um, attitudes and also with physical uh, participation, some of the actions of the Nazi occupiers by participating in mobile killing squad actions, by working at the concentration and death camps, etc. And so um, there's a lot of information out there that you can find right now in the news regarding the handling and approaches of the Polish government and legislation there, as well as the teaching of the history in Poland. Um, the Auschwitz Memorial Museum also has a pretty active social media account that frequently visits this issue. So for the individual that asked this question yesterday, I would strongly recommend you checking out some of the information and resources um, on that topic that are available through the Auschwitz Memorial Museum but then also to look at um, additional information that has been released by US scholars and um, Israeli scholars regarding the issue to get a full kind of shape of it. So to begin our testimonial look um, and our, our focus on parallel stories here, um, I'm now gonna share with you um, the second piece of testimony and echoes and reflections from Ellis Gwynn, because I think he provides us with a good solid transition from his experience in the ghettos to what it is like to arrive in Auschwitz. And so without further ado, here is Ellis in his own words. When we arrived to Auschwitz, the minute they opened the wagons, it was just total, complete uh, misery, beatings and screamings and beatings and barking of dogs and growling of dogs and, and whistles of trains and screaming and beating and screaming and, and commands given. It was, just, it was just like you open the doors and all of a sudden you find yourself in this inferno, in this, in this, in this, in this unimaginable uh, 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 horror that you, as an adult or a child, uh, would see nightmares, and it was just coming through. Uh, and we were just hauling on to each other, and, and uh, I don't know, within minutes, my mother and my sister were dragged to one side, and I was dragged with my dad to another. We were told to go to another side. And uh, they never had a chance to say goodbye to my mother, never had a chance to say goodbye to my sister. Uh, uh, the 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 uh, the pace the speed of this this thing it was done by design it was done to to both for for the person not to be able to c comprehend or understand or, or in any way be able to think for a second what was happening it was just incredible it was just an incredible uh, uh, situation and uh, it was just as I tell it to you now. It's difficult for me to even describe it, 
because it was happening on a, on a minute to minute uh, situation. And uh, I got into the, I got into this line, it was this big line, and uh, I saw my mother on the other side, it was a, another side where the women went. And uh, I, I, I never saw her cry, I, don't, I never saw her reach out. She just, the last time I saw her, she was hanging on to my sister. And my dad hollered to her, you, hang, you, you take care of her, I'll take care of him, in Yiddish. And uh, whatever we have to do, this was the last word I heard. And uh, my dad threw me in front of him. And uh, he says, keep walking very tall, don't even... Because we were observing what was going on in the front, you know, in the front of the lines. And uh, the, very, the one thing you didn't want is for the Germans to, to see that you were holding on to your child because that was the whole idea, is to break up the family, murder the family. Uh, that was the genocide of the whole thing. So by not identifying that this is your child, there was a little bit of an edge you had to possibly survive. The fact that you were on your own and you sort of didn't belong to any family. So Ellis's testimony is incredibly challenging um, to watch and process. It's one that I think really always personally impacts my students, particularly when they've already met him in Unit 4 and we've spent some time talking about his story. Uh, but what are some things now that stand out to you from this piece? of testimony with Ellis. The concept of not belonging to a family, the moment of separation, inability to process what was happening, total chaos, reference to an inferno, which links to his earlier testimony of the devil himself, the nightmare of it, the speed of design to separate, trying to save your family, so you separate, family connection, strength of the father to push the child ahead, a living nightmare, destruction of family, and this minute by minute situation. And the goals of the Nazis are mentioned. Um, you know, his father telling him to stand tall. Um, it's, it's an incredibly, and for most of us, thankfully, impossible situation to visualize. Uh, one of the types of resources that I like to use with my students, and again, um, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, but being careful to um, share appropriate images with our students. Um, we don't want to share overly graphic images with them and horrify them. I think sometimes the words of the survivors paint a visual image that is challenging enough. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I so appreciate our partnership here with Arts and Remembrance is that the work of Esther um, really kind of puts imagery to this without ma making students feel viscerally uncomfortable. Um, and, um, you know, like Esther Ellis is, ex is experiencing that family separation. Uh, and so we can actually see in some very rare photographs that should not have been taken um, some, some of these scenes from uh, arrival at Auschwitz. Most of the arrivals took place at night, um, particularly after the ramp was built into Birkenau um, in the spring of 1944. But we do have a selection of images from something called the Auschwitz album. Um, and they're shown here on the right-hand side of my screen. Um, and so we have these pictures that help to kind of paint, uh, you know, additional realistic images in the minds of our students. Um, and these were taken in May or June of 1944 during the arrival of the Hungarian Jews um, that came in during that time period. So those of you that are familiar with the story of Elie Wiesel and Knight, um, this is around the same time of his arrival. Um, and so we have these images that were taken and were then discovered in the post-war period. 
And so in addition to doing an analysis of art, these photographs can provide an incredibly powerful um, analysis activity for our students. Because a lot of times students will focus on the fact that they can see, you know, two, four, seven guards here. Why are all of these hundreds of people just standing there and cooperating? Um, and you start to talk about, well, who took this photograph? This photograph was taken by the Nazis. Why did the, they take it? Well, we don't actually know because as I mentioned, photography was not supposed to be permitted in Auschwitz during this time. Um, but someone uh, you know, was able to um, capture these images but they're not showing the fact that there were guards that stood on top of the trains in some spots, that there were watchtowers where, in, where guards had weapons. These people had arrived likely after a several day journey with limited food, limited access to water. They were exhausted. And they go down through and show you some additional pieces of this experience. Um, and so I would highly recommend taking the time, if you do teach your students about the concept of the death camps, of looking through these images. Um, ultimately, these images come from a source known as the Auschwitz album, which I see that um, Susan's familiar with. It is, it is a tremendous, tremendous resource to see. Um, and we also have additional um, information about the Auschwitz album through our partners at Yad Vashem. And so you have the ability um, to go to, um, and um, if you just simply Google, and I'll, I'll put this in our working document, Auschwitz album and Yad Vashem, there's even an overview video which talks about the history of the album, where and how it was discovered and donated to Yad Vashem. And you have the ability to page through the album and see the images. The images are heartbreaking, but they're not particularly graphic. Um, it's more of what is not shown that we know is going to happen to these individuals that's so difficult to think about. Um, so we at Echoes and Reflections feel that it is an appropriate resource to share with high school students to have these conversations um, about what was happening in this aspect of the experience of the Holocaust. To conclude this segment on parallel stories, um, I want to share with you one more voice. And um, this particular voice is of um, Itka Zygmuntovich. Itka brings us a female perspective and a slightly older perspective than that of Ellis Lewin. Um, we have two pieces of her testimony in Echoes and Reflections in this unit. Um, Itka was born in Czechanov, Poland, a small shtetl north of Warsaw, and um, she was born in 1926 on April 15, 1926. And she and her younger brother and sister and mother and father were first put into a ghetto in Czechanov, and then they were moved to Novmiastow before they were sent to Birkenau. Um, and she would be the only survivor in her family. Um, and in this particular piece of testimony, you have the opportunity to hear Itka recite a poem, which is another very powerful piece of art that we can use with our students. And I saw some of you chose to incorporate poetry into the Padlet this morning. Um, Itka herself is a published poet. You can find her works on Amazon. And I wanted to share this description, this beautiful description um, of a poem that she wrote um, in her head while she was in Auschwitz. And so here is the voice of Itka. Physically, I was totally enslaved. I had no control of life. Spiritually, I could think and feel what I wanted. And I remember one time when I was in Auschwitz and I felt the burden, the bitter taste of slavery. And I felt, oh, if I would have a pencil and paper now, I would write a poem. But there was no pen pencil and paper. I told you, my earthly possessions was what I wore and the bowl, the enamel bowl from which we got the soup. So I wrote a poem in my, in my head. And when I was liberated, when I came here to America, of course, I couldn't speak a word of English. It was constant adjusting from one to the other. So that was among my first poems, and I would like to share it. I feel like a bird with clipped wings 
tied to this earth by invisible strings, chained to a destiny I did not choose. I feel like a prisoner that cannot break loose. I look at the sky with a heavy sigh, but my wings have been clipped and I can no longer fly. And then I realize that the concept of freedom is a bird in flight and not in a bird in a cage. And I pledge to myself, if I'll get out, I will never use brute force. I will never try to force somebody to do something, but neither will I allow other people to do it. I understood the concept of freedom. I understood what my forefathers, what the, the Jews in Egypt, the Israelites in Egypt must have felt like. And I realized that there is no substitute for personal experience, from knowledge derived from personal experience. I realized then that nothing in the world, no textbook, no professor, not the best college, could teach me what my experience taught me because I had to, I got to know myself who I am, how much I could endure, how much I could understand, how much I could feel, how, what I became. Great. So some responses now to Itka's first piece of testimony and also thinking about some connections you can make between her testimony, um, the delivery of her testimony and Esther's story. So what are some thoughts on her testimony and some connections that we can make with Esther's story? Personal resiliency, yes, absolutely. When we were doing the Jamboard activity yesterday and I was, you know, working on um, getting into thinking about today, um, you know, when I first encountered Esther, I, I really saw it, like I, she made me think of Itka and that determination um, and the power of creativity and spiritual resistance and symbolism as a way to process and expressing trauma through art, um, being mentally free, refusing to accept evil or become evil, um, determination to survive, fighting back internally and discovering who she was, knowing oneself through experience. And those are all um, absolutely parallels that I was making between these two amazing women. Um, Rebecca mentioned she realized she was enslaved physically but spiritually free. They both did what they could to get through it and kept strong values. While doing this, um, Esther did not seem to, to feel captured. She was able to use her wits to evade capture. So we have these different journeys through the Holocaust, but some of these parallels with um, their, their personal and inner um, values and the way that they reveal their feelings through a creative um, alternative method, um, as Eunice mentioned. Um, the very last piece that I wanna share with you now um, comes to us from Itka as well. Um, and I feel like it's one also that spoke to this resiliency. Um, I also see Bernice mentioning the images of birds in Itka's poem and Esther's art. Yeah, I thought of that as well. And the black crows hovering over them on their day of departure and the seagulls um, flying around, openly around the Statue of Liberty um, as well. So art, you know, being healing and you feel free when you create art. Um, the second piece of testimony from Ika, I need to give a little bit more context on before showing it. Um, and I do share this with my students. Um, Ika is, has just transitioned from her arrival in Auschwitz where she is separated from her entire family. Um, and she has told the interviewer about the um, final time that she saw her mother and her younger siblings because her mother basically chose to go with the younger siblings and her mother's parting words to her were, remember my child, don't let them make you hateful and don't let them make you bitter. And that would be the, the mantra with which Itka would live and continues to live the rest of her life. She is now um, 94 years old and she lives in Philadelphia um, and she's kind of my adopted bubby. So I've gotten to know her very well over the course of the last 10 years. Um, we co-wrote her memoirs together and she's just an amazing woman. 
And um, again, when I first encountered Esther, like I just saw so many parallels. And although I never had the privilege of meeting Esther, like I, I kind of just made this connection with the two of them. Um, and so I now want to share with you um, another piece of ITCA's resilience before we move into our next activity. I'd like to describe your day in Auschwitz. We would get up in the morning. To begin with, we slept and worked and wore the same clothes all the time. Every few months, they would disinfect. Every day, we had to be stay in the country there. And they made it responsible. So if, let's say, one would want to run away. And if he had a heart, he said, how can I endanger all? Because then we would all suffer. You could sometimes stay for hours and for days. Dead or alive, everybody had to be accountable. After the appeal, we would always march in five. Eins, zwei, drei, four, five links. Eins, zwei, drei, four, still I hear it in my, and on both sides, the, the um, guards with dogs and marching. When you marched out, sometimes we never knew who would come back because sometimes at random there were selections at the, at the gate that they would take away. I remember there were instances where if one of us looked pale, the other would, sometimes I would do it to Bina and say, Yitkolot, they stole such a blast, you look so pale. And she would pinch my cheek to make her look ready because first of all, they did everything to make us sick. Then they would, they didn't need an excuse. Then they would uh, take it out because she's sick. Just, it was not very mockery. Another thing which was the horrible thing, there was no, you couldn't go to relieve yourself. Then I understood why the balls. And then at work, carried the gravel or the stone from one place to the other. Sometimes they would mock us. And I remember they would point to the gas chamber, where is your guard now? And inside myself, I said, our guard is here, but where is yours? And so despite all of that horrific daily life that Itka lived, she maintains that absolutely resilient feature. Um, and I think it's one that, that always speaks to me and speaks to my students. And so I just wanted to share that parallel story with you as well. Um, as with yesterday, and for those of you that weren't with us yesterday, every survivor who is part of Echoes and Reflections, you have the ability to um, see a fuller version of their bio by clicking here in the lesson plans. Um, additionally, every single survivor who is featured in Echoes and Reflections, you can view their full length testimony in Eyewitness. So I'm popping back over into Eyewitness now. You would simply, once you're signed in, just type in their name. We would type in Itka Zygmuntovich, and you would see that eventually um, through the search function, her name would pop up and you could view her full um, testimony there if you wanted to hear more about her story or Esther's story um, in their own words. Um, the very last part of this parallel stories component that I'd like to share with you is the variety of different topics, not just specific to the Holocaust, you have the to um, bring in um, testimony clips from the genocides in Rwanda and Armenia, etc. They're also ex um, sortable by language. So if you have students that are non-English speaking, you might be able to find a testimony or two in their own languages. Um, sorting them for English only. Um, you can see here that there are a multitude of topics. And we've done the hard work of the vetting them historically so that you know that these testimony clips, despite the fact that, you know, survivor memory is so powerful, it does sometimes have parts of it um, that can be problematic. And so these clips are already pre-vetted for you. Um, so you can use them with confidence in your classroom. And so um, that is just a taste of some of the other options that are available to expand the story. Um, Claire, I wasn't sure if there was anything that you wanted to um, bring in specifically from Art and Remembrance before we dived into the timeline. But um, I'm going to get to that after we do the activity. Um, I guess one thing that I did want to share is that we also, I'm going to put the link here, um, 
is that there is a um, timeline that we created that actually you can erase columns or leave the columns and have your students kind of discover using um, Memories of Survival, Esther's story, um, the time you know, um, juxtaposed to the dates of um, other survivors or what was happening in different regions. So it's both a journey's timeline and using geography so that students use critical thinking and really kind of delve into um, testimony. Thank you for sharing that. And so yeah, we're gonna actually come back to a version of that timeline here um, in just a moment with the activity that we're gonna do. Um, but I absolutely love this timeline from Earth's Remembrance, which I now have on my screen um, because as Claire mentioned, it's flexible. So we've got the ability to, um, to add columns to it and to create parallels between Esther's story, other events that are happening, um, events that are happening in the lives of other individuals. So if you're working with Esther's art in conjunction with a specific piece of literature, you can tie all of that together with this outstanding and also very easy to transition to virtual piece. So speaking of timelines, um, we're gonna now just take a brief look and get an overview of the Echoes and Reflections timeline, as well as another resource that I just wanna share with you very briefly. Um, we had you load the timeline um, for Echoes and Reflections because it is our most data heavy asset on the Echoes and Reflections website. The timeline spans the years 1933 to 1945, and you can access it a bunch of different ways. You can really just start at the top once you've loaded it and just scroll down through, or you can jump over and choose a specific year, and it'll take you directly to that year in the timeline. Every event that is on the timeline has the date as well as a brief description of the event and some type of setting image. Um, and then once you click on the uh, event that you're interested in, so the Evian conference, for example, um, we have within that event additional primary uh, sources, including oftentimes testimonies. Um, you guys met Liesl, um, actually, sorry, you did not meet Liesl yesterday. Another workshop that I did met Liesl yesterday. Um, but Liesl Loeb is, um, has a really interesting testimony. She's another Philadelphia area survivor, and she's talking about immigration quotas. Um, and her family. Um, then we also have secondary sources um, and primary sources that are utilized as well in conjunction with events on the timeline. Then if you click to the right-hand side over here, you'll see um, some specific resources that complement it, including um, some pedagogical information on using timelines to teach history. We also created some specific classroom activities that solely utilize the timeline. If you have a low tech situation, the timeline is available by PDF. So you could download it and just share the text of the timeline with your students. We also have a specific asset guide that is just for the timeline because a lot of the content in the timeline is not actually part of the core Echoes and Reflections resources. It's a really wonderful bonus. And then these two links take you back to our normal lesson plans and our normal audio glossary. Um, in just a few minutes, we're going to turn you guys loose to actually work with the timeline, but I wanted to share with you one other contextual piece um, before we get to that, and it might be something that you can explore as well um, during your timeline session. Um, in our conversation with uh, Bernice and Claire and Mavette and Becca and I, we talked about the fact that many times students in American classrooms are wondering what is happening in America while the Holocaust is occurring and why aren't Americans responding? And the common myth um, that we often hear is that, well, they just didn't know. Americans did not know what was happening um, during the time of the Holocaust. And, and I say myth because it's exactly that. I'll show you how I know that here in just a moment. Um, but in the spring of 2018, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum launched a new exhibition in their basement temporary exhibition area called Americans in the Holocaust. This exhibition is groundbreaking in so many ways. It's groundbreaking um, from the standpoint of um, museum structure and how the assets in the actual exhibition were put together. And it's also groundbreaking in content. And it really looks at the central questions what did the United States government and the American people know about the threats posed by Nazi Germany? 
and what responses were possible and when. And the exhibition online goes chronologically. So just as you scroll down, you begin in 1933 and you work your way through the events of the Holocaust in parallel to their handling in American history. One of my favorite components of this exhibition is that for 1933, 1938, 1942, and 1945, there are these tone setting videos that tell you what is happening in the United States at the time um, in that year, as well as the rest of the world. And so students are so quick to criticize. We didn't do anything to save people in 1933, 34, 35, whatever. While they don't, also likely aren't thinking about the fact that the United States is struggling with the Great Depression. Um, history does not happen in a vacuum, and this amazing website helps to contextualize what is happening here in the United States. It also busts open the myth of what happens um, in American communities regarding news reporting, and I'll show you a little bit more on that in a moment, but it tells us in so many spots during this exhibition that Americans did have the opportunity to know, and oftentimes they reacted. Um, and so it goes through and talks about reactions uh, of citizens, reactions of the government. Um, there's a segment here that shows you newsreels um, that were displayed during this time period in movie theaters, um, talks about the Bund in America. And then as it gets into the late 1930s, there's a specific focus on the refugee crisis um, and responses or lack of responses to the refugee crisis. Um, there is an amazing sub, two sub resources actually, one that looks at American immigration through numbers, um, and I'm going to hopefully get that loaded up here for a second. Um, and it, if you're teaching US history and talking about this time period with Esther, um, you can take a look at why it wouldn't have been easy for someone from Poland, even if the opportunity presented itself to come to the States. And so there's a lot of great information on that. Um, there's also a really great other piece on how complicated it was and actually still is to acquire a U.S. visa. Um, and then I see that there, there was a question on the St. Louis, which I'll get to in just a moment. There's public opinion polls that are sprinkled throughout um, presidential responses, debates. There's an amazing resource on refugee ships. And then there's a whole segment as well on the St. Louis. Um, and it just goes up through. And then it also goes into talking about um, different, uh, you know, things that are occurring as we move into the war and the 1940s and the liberation of the camps. So if you want to broaden your context even further, um, that is one way to do it. And then if you want to help to personalize the story for your students, if you're in a setting where you've got quite a bit of time, um, I strongly recommend you check out what is known as History Unfolded, uh, U.S. Newspapers in the Holocaust. This is a citizen history research project that the museum launched initially in 2014 in beta testing. And then it officially launched in January of 2016. To date, we have collected nearly 30,000 examples of what Americans knew was happening or had the opportunity to know was happening through their local newspapers. There's 42 different events that you personally as citizen historians could contribute to, or you can even have your students work with. Um, and Maryland's lagging behind a little bit um, from his, my state of Virginia. We're almost at 1,000. You guys are only at 369 for those of you that are Maryland-based. Um, and even if you're in the international community, you can still contribute. But it asks you to go in and look through various databases, chroniclingamericannewspapers.com, or even, as I did with my students, going to the local library and using microfilm, which they actually had a blast with. Um, to contribute um, like what your, your newspaper reported. And then if you want to know um, what, what did your newspaper report, I'm going to just show you my, I, I live in this tiny town, Stanton, Virginia. We have 23,000 people. Um, during the era of the Holocaust, there were only 13,000 people living here. Um, and so, okay, it's this tiny little Southern segregated town. They probably really don't care about what's happening to Jews in Nazi Germany um, and Nazi occupied Europe. Well, I can tell you that they, they cared a lot. Um, and this, is, this research is still not complete, um, but my students have found over 200 articles about events that were happening 
at that time. And it's really amazing for them to see while this is happening to Esther and her family, what's being reported here in little old Stanton, Virginia. And so um, again, this link is provided for you in the chat box. Um, it's also provided um, in the working document, but I will tell you, we have even found that the final solution the death camps were being reported in Stanton in November and December of 1942. So the myth of Americans didn't know um, is certainly not one that really holds water anymore. And so um, we thought that that could help build further context um, for students in your classroom if time permits um, as you're using these timelines to, you know, so we, we find this event, the Evian Conference, you can then go to History Unfolded and see if anything's been found um, or, um, or you can then go, um, you know, and do the research yourself if you don't see anything in the History Unfolded database. Um, there is also an option in the database to report no information found. So if you don't see something for your town, it likely means that no one has done the research yet. Um, so what we'd like to do now um, is in the chat box, we're gonna place a copy of the timeline. Um, you'll see it here, I'm in the working document right now. Um, and it says timeline new link. That's the one that you're gonna be wanting to work with um, because what it's gonna do is it's gonna force you to make a copy of it so that you're not editing Claire's original. Um, and we'd like you to play around with the echoes and reflections timeline. Um, again, I'll make that timeline link available to you in the chat box as well, just in case you didn't um, open it prior. And we'd like you to, you know, play around with the timeline as well as the timeline of Esther's life um, and some of the events that are happening to her and just start to fill in events. Like what else is happening in, in Europe, in Poland, in America? as these events are happening. So to help just yourself build some of that context. Um, to complete this exercise, we are going to put you into small groups, but we're gonna encourage you to work independently. However, we thought that the small groups would create an environment where if you do wanna chat with the people um, that are also in the group, if you get stuck or you have questions, and then one of us is also going to be in that group with you. Um, we're gonna give you just about 10 minutes to play around with those resources and then we'll bring you back into the large room. Yeah, and as you're in your groups too, you can also think about modifications, um, you know, ways to do this um, in hybrid teaching. Maybe some of you will be going back into the classroom. Um, and, you know, another option would be to remove columns or take parts out. And, you know, so definitely in the groups, also think about how you can apply this in your teaching. All right, Becca, take us away. I wanna thank Jen for that amazing overview. I think a lot of these tools, um, you know, also our next session is uh, remote teaching and learning, other res resources to the rescue. And I think she handed, <laughs> showed us a, a lot of resources and those are all available to you on that working document. And of course, if you have questions, you can always reach out to um, Jen or myself. Um, I am also learning along with you. Um, I've looked at a lot of Echoes and Reflections and been on many of their webinars. And it's just always amazing to me the depth of information and also the partnerships that they um, have now that really empower the teachers, um, the community leaders, and the students to use all of these. Um, and we are really happy to be starting this partnership. What I'm going to do is bring you into um, a quick overview of the lesson plans and materials resources that are free to you um, from the Art and Remembrance website. And I was just gonna letting my screen.
And that little box always likes to hide right on top of the present button. So there we go. So I want to um, share with you the remote teaching tools for critical thinking and exploration of World War II, human rights, and more. And this is using stories from um, um, Memories of Survival, um, the art of Esther Krenitz Nissenthal, but also um, showing you how that you can collaborate with other resources like Echoes and Re um, Reflections. Um, one thing I think it's important to talk about, I know Jen talked about this and we got, um, I think Julie did an amazing job of, of really showing you this is uh, trauma-informed teaching. Um, in this time of remote learning, you know, we might not have the chance to meet our students in person. So I think it's really important to get to know your students and their interests. Um, make sure that you hear from them um, you know, checking in with them and having um, diverse materials, um, whether it's, um, you know, ebooks or these materials. Make sure that when you're giving the assignments to give your students options, you know, maybe they won't have the, the technology or the skills to see where they're coming from. Um, provide as many opportunities Activities as possible um, and also you know take care of yourselves check in with yourselves and um, just be kind I know you're all doing an amazing job so this is just an example um, this was given to you when you watched the um, video um, on the first night um, how many of you actually did the scavenger hunt anyone you can put it in the text box that's okay if you didn't. There's a lot um, that we're sharing with you. And so basically, this is just an example and all the resources are in fillable PDF. So this could be sent to your students. They could watch it. You can modify these as well. Um, I brought you to the landing page yesterday um, of Art and Remembrance. I'm actually gonna skip to the next one just real quickly, then we're gonna jump onto the site. Um, this is something that's kind of hidden in the resources, but I wanted to get to it because I think it's important for students and right you know, before they start a unit and also in terms of critical thinking to really think about point of view and to analyze where their sources are coming from, especially in this day of getting information from you know, the dinner table or from their friends texting memes that are you know, coming through their phones at the speed of lightning. I think it's really important for students to understand um, the source um, and to also understand how they can um, you know, connect to where that source came from and make sure that it is something that is true. Um, I know that I spent a lot of time on Twitter with people who are also you know, interested in Holocaust education and it's incredible the amount of Holocaust deniers out there. And I am, a lot of students may have heard some of, you know, so don't be surprised if you get, um, you know, comments from students that maybe, um, you know, not everyone's gonna agree with. So just be prepared um, for that. Um, I think that um, using echoes and reflections, everything has been vetted. Um, the story of Esther and Nissenthal, you know, these are all safe things to bring into the classroom. Um, and on that note, with primary sources, art and story, I wanna share with you um, Esther in her own words and images. It just takes. So again, these are all shown on um, the Satori website. And you can get to that from Art and Remembrance from the main um, page. And I like the, you have a, a menu here. So we could go right to Meet Esther and see photographs of primary sources. And here's her green card wedding pictures, list some interactive um, you know, questions like, did you know that um, the dress that Esther wore on her wedding day was a communal dress? And so here we also, you know, um, 
This is her in the army. I think Esther, um, Brittany sh shared that with you yesterday. And then also we go into other um, testimony, which we also included um, um, links to echoes and reflections. This is, so let me go to, um, here's the landing page when you get to the website. And uh, children escaping war and conflict is a great one for early elementary. Um, World War II in Poland, I'm gonna actually open this one up. This is stories um, using Journey's timeline because it gives students a frame of reference. Again, here you can either go into present mode, which gives, um, you know, your students could see your screen and you can go right to the timeline activity, which you just did. And here we also have kind of a, it's not as, um, condensed, I mean, not as uh, long as the other timeline from um, Echoes and Reflections, but um, major events. And then, of course, that link. There's also small quizzes that you could present to your students, like who were the access powers in Europe, and they would be able to, um, you know, take the quiz and it would, we'll just fill in. Whoop. So if they got the wrong answer, I'm just showing you like if they got the, the wrong answer here. Sorry. Where is it not? Italy. Did I click Italy? No. Okay, I thought I did. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so Germany and Italy. And so then you can also, you know, bring this into social studies or history uh, very, very easily. Thank you. Okay. So another um, lesson that we have is um, looking at the different artwork and taking content in context. So you're observing, um, you're explaining, you're inferring, wondering, reflecting. This is an incredible critical thinking activity. Um, so what they're asked to do is to look at specific pieces of art. Um, this is in the Esther in her own words, um, Sutori, and students spend some time looking at art either, um, you know, solo or collaboratively. And this could be done again as a remote teaching opportunity um, to really look at each of the pieces and find the victim, the perpetrators, bystanders, and those who were the helpers, the heroes, and upstanders. I talked a little bit about children escaping war and conflict, and this is something that maybe as you look at headlines, um, you know, even at home, you can ask students maybe once a week to, um, you know, you can create a Padlet or something like that to clip headlines, um, to clip things that are happening around the world, and you can make, um, you know, a, a board that you would usually have in your classroom, but you could do this uh, virtually, and to really start to dig into current and contemporary events. In trauma-informed teaching, it's also, you know, you need to think about, you know, if students are, um, you know, maybe low language learners, early um, English speakers, also if they've recently moved, um, again, you might never have met them. So this could be really, um, you know, upsetting to them, this whole new way of learning. So it's a way to, you know, easily kind of 
go into um, you know talking about conflict and and uncomfortable situations using the artwork. I think again, Julie did a really beautiful job talking about you know just basic human needs, the things that make kids happy, whether it's that chicken dinner that they had, you know, and to find the similarities in survival stories. And in our resources, we have lists of books that are appropriate um, for the classroom. We also have lesson plans on teaching social justice and human rights. Um, I think for those of you who are teaching social studies and history, even language arts, um, it's important that you know students understand that after World War II, the Declaration of Human Rights um, you know, was drafted and also just the word genocide um, was kind of put out there. And so it's important for, um, you know, kids to look at this. There's also some really great ideas for civic engagement and ways that students can find agency and voice in their own communities. Um, again, using maps and timelines, the World War II lesson, as well as Esther in her own words with primary sources. This is a beautiful graphic. I love um, the map and, you know, you could have your students um, map out Esther's journey, um, you know, just giving them a map you know, having to locate. Um, there's ways to do this also um, virtually. Um, you could also have students map out the parallel stories. So where was L.A. Vassell? Where was, um, you know, some of the people on the, um, the testimony that we just heard from? And it gives students a better context of what they're talking about. Um, also, if you have a news um, headline, you know, um, board, maybe have a virtual map where students could post the headlines to where that's actually happening in the world. Um, I don't know how many English language arts um, teachers we have on with us, but if we have time, I will bring you into the HEROES um, lesson plan. This is a really rich, multi-level creative writing and research project where students can find um, kind of the unsung heroes in their communities or can look at historic figures um, or you know, even survivors and to do research. I know that in the UK where we have some members, um, um, visiting us here on this um, platform. We love Beacon Schools, and I wish we had time to talk about that, but that is something that they are so good at, and I've been looking at what students in the UK are doing um, in terms of research and connecting with, with survivors, bringing them into the school either in person or virtually, and doing research projects. I think it's just amazing that the UK has funded that. This is from the lesson plan. Um, you'll be able to get to that in the HEROES lesson plan. And it's an evidence-based chart where students would be able to um, either take a historic figure or someone in their community and do um, you know, evidence-based writing. This is something um, I think I shared with you yesterday. Um, Flipgrid is another wonderful way for students to share their work like we did today. Um, but instead of, um, you know, in a chat room, um, they can also pre-record so it can be asynchronous and they could, you know, share this with partner schools that maybe want to learn about what they're doing. Um, I think it's a wonderful way for students to talk about um, what they're creating. And now on Netflix is a film, it's a documentary, um, Helen Mirren narrates it. And it is um, kind of designed to um, be attractive to young uh, audience. Um, they have a young person who kind of strings the stories together. And it's a uh, five survivors, unfortunately not Esther, but I think as educators, you could definitely have your students tie Esther into this after viewing it. And I think it's a really wonderful new, new tool. It was just released a couple weeks ago. 
And I think another thing for teachers to do um, to support their, their students is definitely apply for that mini grant. Um, look at the lessons, take some time to look at the lessons, um, share those lessons with your colleagues and others, and make sure to sign up for our update. Um, and I'm trying to find my, my chat box again. I'm just, um, I definitely want to know if there's any questions and if not, I can take you into another, um, you know, another site off of Let me go real quickly into the um, Esther and her own words Sutori, because this is something you could easily do. All the art is available here for you to do that lesson that we just talked about. Sorry if I'm scrolling. So if you were to give your students this exercise to really dig in deep and look at both the commentary and the narrative and the artwork to find those victims, perpetrators, you have all the activities. You can break them into four different groups. Um, here's And Bernice, I wanted to know if you wanted to add anything. Uh, well, I think I would just encourage everyone um, to come to our website, look at the resources. Claire did a fantastic job in pulling them all together. And I, I hope that um, you'll use our film, the book, the lesson plans um, as uh, resources to use Esther's, uh, to share Esther's uh, art and story with your students. Um, but I wanted to turn it over to, um, to all of our participants it, um, because we're very much interested in knowing how you might incorporate what you've learned, what you've seen in your classrooms. And um, you can use Padlet to write down your ideas, but um, please also feel free to use the chat box or uh, to speak up if you really uh, want to be heard. But we would love to hear what your thoughts are about how you might bring this to your classrooms and your community. Yeah, I mean, I mean rich days. I'm, yeah. Thank you, Maurice. And just looking at time, I mean, I can screen share real quick on um, the Padlet that we were specifically referring to, um, to share some of those thoughts. Um, one moment, not this. <laughs> um, so if you go to, it looks like page 17 on that working document, um, it's another Padlet now. It's um, Kim, uh, and then a slash community year or Y-A-R. If you click on that, that'll lead you to um, click down on that bring down menu and this will be the new Padlet that you can participate in. Um, just looking at the time, I know we're, you know, we wish we had more time. Um, it's 1147 and I think, yes, absolutely. As we're kind of wrapping up Q&A, last minute Q&A, feel free to add to this Padlet or in the chat, we'll collect that. We're recording all this. So we will collect that information. If you have any questions or thoughts, um, we'll be sure to record those. And I guess, and yeah, also I think one thing we can do um, is that the presenters um, from some of these questions we won't be able to get to. I mean, I'm happy to record responses and throw them onto the Padlet, um, and we can email you and let you know that you know those responses are are available. Um, you know, another thing is we will have new lesson plans rolling out. So make sure to stay in touch with us. Um, you know, we are going to continue to build out these lesson plans from suggestions from you. Um, you know, the things that you've suggested, we're going to enhance and create. Um, make sure to also do the evaluation because that helps all three organizations continue to bring this type of programming to you. Uh, Yep, and that online ev evaluation again can be found on that working document. So if you close, if you again scroll further down after that Padlet, um, just follow this link, 
click on it and then click on the second link that appears that will take you to that survey. And um, I saw a question in the chat box, contact information, stuff like that. In this working document, again, you can find the contact information for Echoes and Reflections, um, Art and Remembrance. Claire put her own information in there too. So um, if anyone, you know, other speakers want to put their information in here, we can do that. Um, and then you know where to reach ABAM. Um, always email us at info at abam.org, but um, we can also put that in there as well. Um, oh yeah, Becca Plum, you can reach out to Becca Plum or myself, um, who is our education director. And I know we have a lot of um, questions about recordings. How is that going to work? Um, I believe last we spoke, we are going to kind of edit it down as much we can, still keeping all the relevant important information. And then I think we'll make that um, live in our YouTube channel. Um, yep. AVAM has um, a YouTube channel where we have um, a lot of virtual workshops and programs um, that we've been doing through this shutdown. So um, I can put that at the bottom of this document as well. And that's where the recording um, will be once we get everything edited. Because it's going to be I, three hours. I wanted, to, I wanted to just check in with participants. We had some really great uh, uh, images and little stories uh, from the home exercise last night, which we would like to be able uh, to share in you know, some cases in social media. So if anyone has any objections to our sharing any of these, please let us know so we can make sure not to include them. But otherwise, we'll kind of um, do some judicious uh, selections. I hope that's OK. I guess um, Reflections I also has a lot of other online programs coming up. If you go to our website and click on our prepare session, we have additional online conferences coming up through August. We can even plan stuff for your school districts where we can deliver a virtual conference to your own schools or areas or communities um, on a variety of different topics related to the Holocaust. We have um, programs on night, teaching with night, um, on media literacy, etc. So please don't hesitate to reach out be more than happy wherever you are in the country um, to come to you. And Eunice asked about certificates. Um, we're we're going to be getting those to um, AVAM here probably in the next day or so. Um, and so if you, Becca, you wanted participants to contact you if they need a certificate, correct? Sure. I can also um, send it out. Yeah, just contact me if you want it. Otherwise, I'll just send a follow up to everyone who registered. And um, continue to tweet because today um, all of those who followed and tweeted um, with Meet Esther will be eligible to win a copy of Memories of Survival and we'll get that shipped out to you and I'll announce the winner this evening. Yep, and I think one last question I saw, well, I'm sure questions are still coming in, but another one that I saw, um, be sure to save this link in this for this working document. Now that you have access and you have that link, that link is yours to keep and to follow and to come, go back to and refer to for all these links that we've shared throughout the two-day workshop. Um, Becca or Mavette, yes. uh, would one of you add to the that document would one of you add my contact information because i realized that the art and remembrance link that's there is probably just to our mailing list sure it's not for a mailing list and add that to the document okay you can it just do contact us at art and remembrance.org okay great thank you no question Yeah, don't forget about that survey that um, is really important for, um, I mean, all of us to kind of help collect data and um, information. We got so many comments uh, yesterday evening and even sprinkled throughout today um, about how, how many of you felt, um, I guess, got a lot of uh, meaning from the session and were very moved by parts of it and very enriched by other parts of it. 
Um, so we are incredibly gratified by your response to our efforts to provide this to you. It's why we do what we do uh, to bring this out to you and for you to bring it out to your students and your community. So I do hope that um, it doesn't stop here, <laughs> that uh, this is the end of the workshop, but we hope that the most important part takes place um, in the days and weeks and months to come when you bring this to your students and communities. So if there's anything else that you need from us that will help, um, that will help you in doing that, please uh, feel free to get back in touch with us and let us know. And I, I know that this is true for all of us. We do hope that um, it won't be too long before you can get to see Esther's art yourself and see your students again in, in person too. But in the meantime, we'll try and provide you with resources, or we hope that we've provided you with resources that you can use um, at a distance from, from everyone. So um, I don't know, is, did we want to uh, have any other concluding uh, comments? But I know I want to just say from me personally, it has been really an honor to be with you during this time and to share Esther's art and her story with you. So thank you so much. I got some claps. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yay. I think we did it. <laughs> Thanks for sticking around um, and hanging with us. And yeah, this, this, I mean, I've learned uh, so much. So this is, uh, it was really, really incredible for me too. And, yes, and thank you so much, Bernice and Claire and Jennifer, um, for this mega collaboration. I think everyone worked really well together. Again, the museum is still closed, but we will hope to be open um, very soon. So keep an eye on our website and our social, and then um, hopefully we can get in there. And we are, I should also mention this too, so we are offering virtual tours during this time with um, some of our amazing docents, which are were part of this workshop today. So if you are interested in that, you can contact us as well um, for a virtual tour for your students or even a group of adults. Um, yeah. And if the virtual tour doesn't work out, the virtual gallery on the art and remembrance, you know, <laughs> um, it also has every single resource that we just talked about, including um, student interactive like quizzes and forum questions embedded within that and you're free to change it up however you need. It's a tool that we wanted to give to all the teachers. Excellent. You got options. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and actually on the Art and Remembrance uh, website in the Fabric of Survival Gallery, which is yet another, um, another gallery of Esther's uh, artwork in uh, about a portion of the images have uh, audio from me and my sister um, just commenting on, on that particular piece of art. So that's yet another resource. Yeah, and actually all those audio are also embedded on the teacher tool, so. Good stuff, spend some time <laughs> looking at it all. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Take care, Thanks. stay so much.